Um, so as Matt said, I'll be talking about um, what we have done in Oxford and I, I will try and really follow the brief and uh, point out what is specific to history and I have been finding this really difficult um, because it is um, so interlinked with um, so many other aspects of our library services. Now just very briefly, um, in case you don't know, the Bodleian is a legal deposit library. Um, we have over 100 libraries in Oxford, um, so, and I will be talking a little bit more about the, the staff, the kind of colleagues who are actually contributing to this huge endeavour, but I will be focusing primarily on the Bodleian libraries and more specifically the History Faculty Library, which is embedded in the Radcliffe camera. Um, this is not a polished performance. <laughs> I've not had much time to uh, uh, organise uh, the slides or time them in any way. Um, and just an hour ago, I was actually in the building that you see behind me. Um, so we are starting to return to the sites and we had a building safety induction in the, in the beautiful Divinity School. Um, so things are starting to resume back to normal. Um, but really what I want to do today and, and what today actually gave me an opportunity to do is to think retrospectively, um, also trying to be analytical about it, um, what uh, has actually happened since we closed our libraries to our readers on the 17th of March, followed by complete lockdown on the 23rd of March. It was quite a momentous change as it was for everybody else and presented very rapid, confusing at first, very pressured um, timescales and stressful. Um, but librarians are very agile and flexible, so um, it was in some ways <laughs> a very interesting experience. So I'll talk a little bit about the retrospective. Um, I then want to refer to the importance of looking at the university strategy uh, for moving forward and also do a little bit of horizon scanning. So that's the plan. Um, so just thinking back, I, I feel that we are currently in two phases, at, le at least here in Oxford. And the first one really started from the point of closing our reading rooms to our readers um, to about now, um, where we have undergraduates and postgraduates, they're just finishing off their exams, written exams. Um, taught postgraduates are also working on dissertations um, and they've been given extensions until the end of July. And they primarily need um, uh, secondary readings, so books, chapters and such like. And a uh, number of them will also need printed primary source materials. Um, we've not had huge demand for um, special collections specifically. Um, and then we have the, uh, the postgraduates, the research students, the early career researchers and academics um, who also require secondary reading, but um, less so in this particular phase than the others. University is planning to run outreach events um, to open days in uh, summer schools and we'll do them virtually. Um, so they are increasingly on our radar. Um, but for external readers, it's been really, really quiet. I've been contacted only once, I believe, by an external reader. So that's kind of been most of the phase um, since March until about now. And I'm starting to notice that this is changing. Um, so getting many more inquiries now from the researchers and the academics um, who are still looking for secondary readings, but there's much more demand now for the primary sources as um, teaching now has stopped um, and examination will start to stop and marking up um, will then be done and completed. Academics are really turning their minds to the research that they want to continue. Um, there's also REF um, publications need to be assessed. Um, so we're getting inquiries about getting access to those um, so that they can do this work. Um, so th that's the kind of second phase. And we're seeing this really from the end of June till I'm, I'm not entirely sure until how long this phase will be. Uh, probably right up till end of September when the new academic year will then start. Uh, but that was just a kind of quick analysis of the community that, that we're serving. And then, of course, <laughs> most of our work was really trying to find the materials for them, which is what they wanted. And Scan and Deliver um, involved a number of tasks, and I won't go through these because you probably will have done all of these as well, possibly more that, that I don't know about. Uh, but finding scans in our own collections, um, using the tutor's private libraries to scan under the HE um, Copyright Licensing Agency license um, was useful. It's interesting that we found that the digital content store wasn't actually hugely useful to us overall in Oxford. Uh, only 10% hit rate um, for all the subjects, um, but nonetheless it was useful to have. And of course the relaxation of the licensing terms by the CLA was really welcome. 
Um, I just want to highlight one aspect which um, we were quite chuffed with, of being quite creative in scanning around what material was already available. Um, and we called on the Araku Vault. So Araku is the Bodleian's Accessible Resources Unit who scan for impaired, uh, visually impaired readers, students on registered courses, do the scans for them. And they are reported that they had four and a half thousand scans there, which we could draw on, all in a vast spreadsheet, so not easiest to discover um, in some ways. Um, and when, of course, we could only use 10% of those scans, but nonetheless, this was an additional resource that we could then draw on. Um, so in response to demand from researchers, uh, we will be offering free scan on demand from special collections now as well. And that, that is very new for us. So our colleagues in the Western Library are working hard on how to make that safe and how to make that possible. There's a lot of discussion also how, um, who can get this free scanning as well. So I think in the first instance, we will be limiting it, it to university members. But there is a, a real question here of how much we should also be serving um, researchers from across the world, essentially. Um, but the free and the purchasing materials, um, again, this will be all familiar to you. Um, we got lots of freebies, uh, hugely grateful to all the publishers who helped with that. And of course, the challenge was just keeping up with the announcements. I, I really had a sense for the first three weeks, four weeks after lockdown, it was absolutely frantic communication. I heard from so many different people, many different news and we passed them on to colleagues. Um, so keeping up, I think, was, was really challenging. Um, but I really liked the approach that just took to provide a spreadsheet that we could keep checking and use that. Um, we also had very much sort of personal contacts also, which was um, very interesting and very useful. Um, so just again, so highlighting Oxford specific things which were very annoying. So electronic legal deposit, uh, already before COVID-19, heavily criticised by our academics. You may not know that um, the electronic legal deposit material can only be accessed from library PCs. Uh, so they were completely inaccessible, even though they existed in electronic format. So in part, we had good news because most of the time we could purchase them as individual ebooks. But um, it was really difficult to explain that in some instances this was not possible. Uh, so some ebooks are not available in Oxford as individual purchases like Paul Grave Macmillan ones, or some um, didn't exist on any of the vendors that we could use. So that was really frustrating. On the other hand, we did have some success in uh, becoming a Hattie Trust member and thereby having access to their emergency temporary access service. And this, uh, we've been in a member now since 1st of June. It took several weeks actually to set this up um, because of complicated legal arrangements. Funding had to be found for it as well. Um, but the timing could not have been better. Um, we're very fortunate in, in some ways that um, this could start as early as um, the earlier this week, that readers have access to 1.5 million records, additional ebooks for which we have the print, but which are currently inaccessible. And that is the terms um, that we could use Hattie Trust for. So um, I don't want to go into the National Emergency Library. There's been lots of discussion about this. Um, I'm just so pleased that is off the plate. We don't have to worry about that anymore because that was hugely controversial. Um, in terms of staffing resources, buying ebook packages, if you had the money, was, of course, a much better way of dealing with the workload. In the History Faculty Library, uh, between mid-March and the 2nd of May, we had um, something like 740 individual ebook recommendations. That was a huge amount of work for us, checking multiple vendors and then discovering we haven't got it, replying to the reader. Um, so buying ebook packages very early on, we identified as a key strategy. Um, and I'll talk about finances later on, um, but just to briefly explain, these are the activities that we have done. Um, we ran a demand-driven acquisition project um, with Project, uh, with ProQuest. The money was um, sucked up really quickly. Um, there was so much demand on it um, that uh, within a few days we had to shut it down. Um, you might be interested to know that the top download from that project um, was Peter Burke's um, What is Cultural History? And the historians overall did really well in this compared to other subjects. So they were like gannets, throwing themselves at the records and downloading and reading as much as they could. 
So we, we're not hugely in favour of DDAs, um, which we suspected would um, be difficult with the money running out quickly. So um, we we're much keener um, running an evidence-based acquisitions project with CUP. Um, and before we actually went down the ebooks packages, um, I did an analysis based on the History Faculty Library loans from a whole, a whole academic year last year and to analyse by publisher, um, just to uh, remind myself of who these were. And I mean, I, I knew it actually in my heart, but I, it was good to see this has been borne out by those reports. So OUP, CUP and Routledge were the top three. So it was absolutely critical for us um, having already OUP access. We needed CUP as well. So we picked up discussions with CUP in April and we arranged to have a humanities evidence-based acquisition project, um, which will run for 12 months. Um, and that was all set up. I wasn't hugely involved in this initially until I started looking at the spreadsheets of what we were getting. And I realized that history wasn't included because history is in social sciences in CUP. So I've had a very interesting discussion um, with my contact there about why this is, and um, they're not going to change it, by the way. So this was at least news to me. You, you may have known about it already. But these were one of these many things that we have found in, in throughout this time that sands were constantly shifting. And just when you think you've nailed down something, something else pops up. Um, so the other packages that we will be looking at, um, but they're really more questionable, is to go with uh, Taylor and Francis and de Gruyter. So similar types of um, uh, packages and uh, approaches. Again, looking at looking for evidence, because we anticipate that for the next 12 months, we'll have a similar situation where we'll need to provide huge amount of um, electronic content. And while this runs for a whole 12 months, we have the entire um, access to the entire CUP humanities ebooks list, of which we then re can retain however much we paid up to. So the, having access to this vast resource is fantastic. We will also be looking to add more European publishers or vendors ebook platforms. We already have Casalini's Torossa, um, but we're now very much interested in, in Ama Libre. So that, that is a piece of work that is on, ongoing. So with e-textbooks, um, we these are the four that uh, we are offering in Oxford. Um, Pelego trial started yesterday. Um, I have found for history, um, or at least our reading lists, um, they weren't actually hugely helpful. Um, you find the odd needle in the haystack, uh, but it was a huge amount of work with very little return actually finding what we needed. I think Pelego might be a bit better, uh, but it's early days at this point in time. So I'd certainly be interested to know from others how you found your experience with um, e-textbook providers. But for us, it wasn't a hugely valuable tool. So just turning to money, um, this, everything that was happening at the same time. So while we're buying lots of things, we also had to find the money for it. Um, the easiest clearly was to divert any remaining funds to e-books and agreeing the mechanisms for doing that with colleagues. Um, we're enormously grateful that college librarians who had previously already been contributing to the purchases of ebooks in Oxford, they increased them um, and they found their own mechanisms of, of doing so. Um, so that, that was really very helpful. Um, then in other ways, we need to, to assess the value of our print commitments because we don't think they will all be coming in following the disruption that we've had. And even the European vendors are starting and, and are waiting to send the books, um, the orders to us we still think that a huge amount won't be coming in. And we're trying to find a way how we can estimate the value of this because um, we won't be able to roll this money over. So therefore we need to spend it. And this could go towards the, the purchases of eBooks. But, but how one does that is actually really difficult. So what really helped of course, is that the zero VAT um, was moved forward to 1st of May um, for e-publications and um, vendors are now working on uh, the value of the VAT refunds that we're expecting. So this, this is all good news, but at the moment we still don't have the figures. So that makes planning for us really difficult. Um, and just to explain perhaps, um, our financial year in Oxford runs from the 1st of August to the end of July. So we're coming up to the point where we will need to make decisions on spend. So we have considered bidding to the university for some emergency funding as well, but that hasn't actually yet happened, um, pending resolutions on our end further. 
uh, and also asking for budget relief. I, I don't think we have done that yet, um, and we may not need to come to that point depending on the VAT refunds and such like. So regarding um, archiving or storing and making the the ebook de details discoverable, um, that was another huge amount of work. Um, so about 145,000 mark records were added to our discovery tool, um, which is Primo. And there was a, a lot of internal discussion of who goes first, which resource is more important than the other. So the sciences were very keen, the social sciences and humanities were all arguing with each other. And we had to agree a priority list of ingest of the mark records. So these were things we've never had to worry about in the past. We then also agreed that um, the records would be flagged up with the date they would be expiring on, because as I'll explain later, tutors were speed assessing, reassessing their reading lists, and at the same time as we wanted to ingest the records. So um, if they could see that um, a particular resource was only temporarily available, they could then judge whether they should include it in the reading list or not. So a lot of thought had gone into that. At the moment, um, our colleagues, our systems librarians are very busy adding 1.5 million links um, into our records, um, which will link to the How to Trust emergency collections. Um, this can't be done at the same time. It takes up to two weeks to do so, and it's, it's come with a number of problems, as we've now discovered. Um, but that's a huge amount of work. But it's really important that um, we do as much as possible in the single resource, like um, our Primo resource, because that is where everybody goes to at the first place. We then also move forward our launch of Brozin, Brozine, ooh, Browsing. So I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, I know a number of libraries already use this in the UK and further afield. Um, this is something we've been wanting to do, and it's really was to aid discovery as well. So that, that was moved forward. Um, so just very briefly, there are a number of other things, services that I won't go into any detail, but we extended our live help um, uh, to, for the first time now, to run it also over the weekend. Um, we accelerated our support for reading lists online. We also launched, or rather university launched, access to census access, which I believe a number of universities also in the UK use. So that was a very timely uh, launch because it allows uh, students to very easily convert files into another file format. It's, it's primarily aimed at um, impaired readers. Um, and then of course, like everybody else, uh, we're doing information skills training on Teams and doing lots of recordings and we all hate looking at each other and hearing our voices. So we're all having to come to terms with this. And I'd just like to mention also that um, a number of college librarians who have actually been able to get into their buildings where we, we haven't, and they have additionally offered also a click and post which has been um, excellent and has certainly been very well received by readers. So just mentioning library stuff, I was thinking who's been involved in this and it's it's been pretty much everybody actually. And the people we have furloughed um, are out of our staff and a number of reading room staff who did not have access to the internet um, or to other, other reasons or self-isolating etc etc. But when I look, when I made this list, it's actually the whole library um, is really running on steroids. Um, we're, we're normally busy as it is, but this was just completely un, uh, just scaled up to, to a, a level I'd never seen before in my entire career. Um, and we were doing this while the shift, the sands were ever shifting. Um, and I can give you numerous examples and I won't bore you with them, but everybody was very busy. So even the head of assessment to uh, arrange feedback, to collect statistics so we know what was going on, staff development, promoting well-being, communications, helping with web pages, etc, etc. Everybody was really busy. So it just showed um, the kind of scale of it all and, and how important everybody is. It's not just the subject librarians, it's all their support that you get from everybody else, um, all contributed. So just moving on to faculty liaison, um, right from the beginning, it was really important to know what the plans were in the faculty for teaching and examination. And of course, they were trying to work it out themselves. So again, we had this, this initial period where there's a lot of um, unknown issues that we weren't quite sure what to deal with, uh, but we had an idea that there would be provision would be needed. Um, so we then, the first thing was, that was done is while the faculty was working out its um, strategy, all the reading lists 
um, that were needed had to be reassessed and the tutors did this on themselves with assistance with uh, library staff and they then told us um, what needed to be bought and we then checked um, what was available so we there was a lot of interaction between us and the tutors we then encouraged um, individual ebook requests using forms and we as I said we got lo loads of those coming through we kept the library committee informed. Um, lots of committees in the faculty were cancelled, but the library committee was definitely one of the few that had to keep going because we're so important. So we gave reports to them at what we'd done. We consulted with them. We got feedback from them. We told them what, we're, what our plans were going forward. Um, and we also offered our special tips um, because all the tutors were checking for online um, alternatives themselves, not just ebooks and such like, but anything that was on online. Uh, and of course, we needed to tell them that there are certain things they will not be able to use um, because of copyright. Um, so we provided a, a lot of guidance to them. So we just kept communicating with them. Um, so communication obviously is hugely important with this and the challenges that I have found relate to the whole scale of the endeavour, the timings are really difficult, um, that you, you can't send off half-baked emails but at the same time everybody's waiting for news from you, so I found that was difficult. There's a whole lot of channels that you want to communicate through and we have well-established channels but in this case we actually had to find new ones as well and the sequencing of the news so that everybody understood actually what was going on um, and that people were being informed in a timely manner, but also in a sequence that um, didn't upset anybody. So informing library staff is normally a good idea, but sometimes that wasn't even possible and the readers were informed before the library staff were even. So these are some of the difficulties that we had. So here's just an idea of the communication that we did. Um, so these are email updates um, that we had, uh, lots of websites, we informed the college librarians, but also kept in touch with the humanities division, student union, and of course using social media. We got lots of love from everybody, lots of really good feedback, everybody's chuffed. They think we should run the country, librarians rule. Um, so that was, that was really wonderful to hear. So just looking ahead, um, we need to know what the university is planning to do and understand what their teaching plans are. We ourselves in the library need to review our own strategic um, objectives and we're not even sure at this point in time whether opening hours should be reduced or lengthened. Um, with historians who need to use the, 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 the collections in the sites, the, the kind of um, site um, services that we'll be giving are hugely important for them. For finance, um, there's a difficulty of uh, trying to address the teaching needs as well as the long-term research needs. Gaps are already appearing because we've not been able to buy newly pu um, published uh, research material. And then we need to resume the support for the researchers, as I mentioned, and redesigning the services in all of this is hugely challenging. So just looking ahead briefly, um, we've got the immediate cliff edge. So these are a number of resources who will stop on the 30th of June, um, where we haven't heard back from the vendors whether they will extend them. So this is something we're looking at at the moment and see how we can um, uh, you know, resolve these issues. We've got um, freezers coming up. We've got recruitment freezers already taking place. Um, as I mentioned, there are permanent gaps already appearing because we're not doing much purchasing. Um, and the fact is that the vast majority of the collections are inaccessible while we are closed to the readers and opening these is hugely challenging. Um, just this morning with my induction I, I saw how difficult it is going to be. Other threats are going to be the whole impact on the publishing industry, especially the smaller publishers or specialist sub -sub publishers and charities and scholarly societies. And let's not forget the bigger context, um, LGBTQ, we've got Black Lives uh, Matter, as well now so we've been writing reading lists um, to to show what resources we have that might um, be of interest and Athena Swan, um, Plan S, there's, there's lots of contexts that we had before and that in themselves were, were challenges already so these are still there that we need to bear in mind. So just very briefly in summary and I hope I'm not overrunning too much, um, so uh, we feel that all of this, the COVID-19 situation has certainly accelerated the use and provision of e-resources and especially e-book provision without a doubt. And online reading lists were probably behind everybody else in the country, uh, but we have large number of reading lists, uh, so several hundred um, in humanities, but all of this was accelerated and even those faculties who were very dubious of using Talis Aspire, they're now enthusiastic about it, so that's good. Um, we want to do more digitization of spe special collections, 
Um, innovative teaching, I think all of these things that we have to do, I think we should have been doing them anyway. Um, and, and just to mention and just emphasize what everybody has been saying, that the, the archives, the museums and the libraries, these are the historians' labs. And in Oxford, the, the labs, um, the, the, they got a particularly bad name actually for themselves, unfortunately, because they were chosen as the pilot in the university for opening, not the libraries, but the, the labs. So we being compared, uh, being compared to those labs, we are the historians' labs but we're not the supermarkets. So that's the other comparison that we keep getting with. Um, so we're being told, why are you not open when I can go into a supermarket? Um, and we have to explain to them why that is not the case. Um, so these are just a, really a gallop through um, my experience here in Oxford. I'd love to hear some questions and comments, um, but also hear from other people so anything that, that was different or interesting and innovative. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Matt, for inviting me to take part in this afternoon's session. Um, I'm starting my talk this afternoon with a quote from Professor Justin Champion, his inaugural lecture, which was provocatively titled What Are Historians For? Um, Justin, who sadly passed away this week, was my PhD supervisor from 2001 to 2005, and he first introduced me to the IHR and the conversations about the past that take place within it. He had a close and long association with the Institute, having been its co convener of the 17th century British history seminar for many years and the history profession um, in his passing has lost a radical thinker and a brilliant communicator. I've picked this quote as my starting off point this afternoon as I'd argue that history libra librarians and archivists share this responsibility to connect the past to the public through the collections that we keep, particularly those that we've chosen to preserve permanently as part of our archives and special collections. This public function of academic libraries can often be lost as we strive to cater for our paying customers and the academic staff who are most dependent on our services. And I was interested in the um, comments um, of Isabel um, earlier about the, the discussion around um, providing services for external um, users. We're having similar discussions ourselves at Leicester. This afternoon, I'd like to offer some reflections on how our archives and special collections in Leicester have been connecting with the public during lockdown. While our reading room has been closed since March, we've nonetheless reached new audiences for our collections. Some of this has been by design, as part of projects funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Some of it has been entirely by accident, as unprecedented numbers of users have stumbled across our free to access digitised collections whilst confined to their homes. I'm going to try to avoid um, this afternoon telling you about how we've been doing the same things that you've all been doing as well. Uh, we've been having our team meetings in teams or switching our learning events to Blackboard Collaborate, uh, although I probably will end up doing a little bit of that. And instead I'd like to um, talk a bit about what we've done and then reflect a bit on how this experience might come to shape our work in future. So first of all, the, the accidental engagement um, with our historical directories collections. Um, as some of you may know, Leicester hosts a, a range of um, online resources relating to English local history, mostly created through previous GISC and lottery funded projects dating back um, as far as um, the New Opp Opportunities Fund of the late 90s. It's quite a well used resource, with most of the traffic coming to um, that collection of 675 um, historical parade directories, which are particularly popular with family and local historians. It's a bit of a marmite. Um, of, uh, of, of resources in that we receive um, some very nice positive feedback um, and um, a few um, tweets where people find the site um, a little bit of a struggle to um, negotiate. However, we during, however during lockdown we found um, traffic um, to our um, online resources has risen um, at a remarkable rate. Um, since um, lockdown began, we've received 46% more page views, 43% more sessions, and an increase in the number of pages per session or average session um, duration. So more people are finding out um, resources uh, and when they're there, they're staying for longer. And there's a bit of evidence that that increase has accelerated um, over the last three months. So during the last month, page views were up um, compared with the same time last year by over 70%. I'd like to say that this increase in traffic has been the result of a clever social media campaign and targeted user engagement, 
but nothing could be further from the truth. It turns out that if you stop people leaving home, they are far more likely to begin accessing name-rich collections of primary source material on the internet. And the longer you make them stay there, the more likely they are to eventually turn to family, house or local history. What these crude analytics suggest is that during a public health crisis, while many people have been experiencing financial hardship, social isolation, illness, bereavement, or been struggling with their mental well-being, there has remained a public appetite to engage with history and heritage online. And this brings me on to the first of two live National Lottery Heritage Fund projects that we have based in special collections at the moment. The University of Leicester has a unique founding story. We were one of the later red brick universities established in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and were founded by local people as a memorial to the First World War. Without the means to embark upon grand building schemes in the immediate aftermath of the war, instead our founders identified a home for um, what was originally Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland College within the grounds and buildings of what was built as Leicestershire and Rutland County Lunatic Asylum um, and shown here on the slide in um, different um, phases of its use as a, as, a, as a lunatic asylum, as a military hospital during the First World War, and then with our first small group of students in 1922. The title of our project draws on the university motto, but vitam habient, or so that they may have life. And it was conceived as a 12 month project to engage students, staff, alumni, and the wider community in making our foundation story and early history better recorded and more widely known through. Uh, making some of our archive collections better described and more accessible, researching stories of the people, places and events associated with our history, sharing these through a programme of events and dissemination activities, and offering our participants and volunteers the opportunity to gain new heritage skills through three to attend training days and supporting volunteer activities. And this programme of activities and events was designed to achieve um, some of the um, outcomes um, required of, um, of National Lottery Heritage funded projects, engaging a wider range of people with heritage, improving the um, heritage interpretation, um, giving people the opportunity to develop, to develop new skills and to have learnt about heritage leading to, to changes in ideas and actions. It was a project that was It was a project that was meant entirely to be focused on working with volunteers to improve access to and interpretation of some of our physical archive collections. We were also planning to work with schools in the development of learning resources and to provide young people from low participation neighbourhoods with the experience of visiting a university library. Two months in, we hit lockdown and we had to completely rethink how we were going to deliver um, the um, outcomes, intended outcomes of the project. The activities were designed around a number of strands, the first of which was an archival skills strand, and we planned to work with volunteers to preserve, describe and digitise files from our university archives and give them practical experience and new skills in the process. Instead, we switched our activities um, when we went into lockdown to working with volunteers to enhance the metadata records for a large collection of digitised photographs from our archives, making them better described and discoverable by, discoverable by researchers. We had a, a series of research strands um, planned, which again were, were largely going to be um, based around access to our physical collections. Um, and instead, we've made alternative arrangements either by um, making more use of some of our existing digitised resources or um, having staff members in the weeks before lockdown furiously photographing material from the archives on their mobile phones and then making that available um, for our remote volunteers to access via um, a, a Google Drive space. And here's one of our volunteers and, uh, and, their, um, and their workspace at home. We were planning um, a series of um, training activ activities, talks, um, events, um, informal knowledge sharing sessions with our volunteers that we were expecting would involve um, uh, a budget for tea and cake. Um, and instead, um, we um, have, have rapidly switched those to um, delivering um, things via either Teams or um, Blackboard Collaborate. 
we're still working on how we'll be presenting and delivering some of the outputs of the um, of the of the activities and of the of the project. But we're likely to see a shift away from things like the sort of on-site exhibitions and campus-based events that we'd originally anticipated to uh, more digital outputs. So our research associate Yuande has been providing one-to-one -one mentoring with our volunteers to build their confidence in writing about the past to the web, initially through producing blog posts, and such as a couple that I've uh, shown on the slide there. We're also planning to work with some of our museum study students to create learning resources aimed at Key Stage 2 children that could either be used in schools or adapted for home schooling. Probably the, the biggest negative impacts on um, the work that we had planned have been around the work that we were um, intending to do to improve the um, catalogue descriptions and to digitise some of the physical content within our archives. And this I would um, recognise has been hugely frustrating. It, it's, it's difficult to get this kind of funding um, and um, it's unlikely that we will have the, the opportunity to do this work in the same way uh, again in the future. And we've also so far not been able to carry out some of the oral history interviews that we were um, that we were planning with some of our um, older alumni. However, in terms of the benefits that we were um, aiming for for people and for participants in the project, so far we've been able to adapt our planned activities, um, I think more easily than we anticipated, um, to work towards each of our planned outcomes. So we've got um, volunteers working across all of our activity strands, we had well attended um, online um, events and we're beginning to see some of the um, some of the um, outputs that we were um, hoping for um, when we were planning the project. Our second um, heritage funded project is um, our role as a regional hub for the Unlocking Our Sound Heritage um, project for the Midlands. Um, this is a partnership led by the British Library. Some of you may well be um, familiar with it. Um, with funding from, um, from the Heritage Fund. We're one of 11 partners, including nine other regional hubs working across the UK. The aim of the project is to preserve and provide access to as much as, as possible of the nation's rare and unique sound recordings. There is a professional consensus that we have approximately 15 years in which to save many of our sound collections before they become unreadable and effectively lost, although I think I've been putting that 15 years in presentations for about the last five years, and um, so we're probably um, 10 years away um, from losing those collections. We have a team, here they are, of um, five staff working on digitising, preserving, cataloguing, cataloguing and engaging audiences with at-risk sound collections from across the Midlands. There are targets for the numbers of items digitised, catalogued, and rights cleared for public access, targets of volunteer involvement, and for learning events delivered and the numbers of participants in them. Prior to lockdown, the project had made um, many um, impressive achievements uh, by the team. They preserved a range of at-risk audio collections covering di uh, diverse ranges of subjects, from recordings of comic acts using local dialect, to a portrait of a village recorded in the 1950s, to an archive of radio reports on a national child abuse scandal. They've delivered uh, training events for volunteers on processes, in, processes involved in preserving and archiving sound and provided volunteers with opportunities to develop um, new skills in the preservation of sound. They've worked with um, academic departments on learning and teaching activities and specifically with our museum studies department on the use of sound in museums, um, creating a cohort of sound heritage ambassadors who will go on to careers in the heritage sector in the UK and overseas. As of March, the team were also about to embark on a programme of engagement activity to create reminiscence resources for use with people with health conditions affecting memory, and primarily dementia sufferers. Lockdown has obviously had a, a, a significant impact on the um, project. I'll go back to my last slide. Um, the biggest of which, um, this is Richard, our um, audio preservation engineer, um, has been that it has completely halted um, the digitisation activity um, for three months, leading to uh, us to um, revise our um, KPIs and targets um, for the remainder of the project. It's also impacted on face-to-face -face engagement, including volunteering and outreach, and on our ability to um, bring in other collections from across the region 
um, that we will be um, digitizing and preserving. However, um, we have been able to continue to work remotely with volunteers, some of whom have been producing summaries of spoken word recordings and busily editing sound recordings in line with their passions. Um, like this one about Leicester City Football Club's 1949 FA Cup run. FA Cup run. The reminiscence project has also been able to begin without on-site access to collections or without the capacity for face-to-face um, -face activity and bearing in mind um, that activity um, is likely to involve working with um, care homes um, that will be continuing to adapt and um, to operate in a different way. So what have we learned and what challenges um, are there arising from this um, experience and this um, connects I think with some of the, the, the comments that Isabel made earlier. I think when, when both special collection staff and our stakeholders think about engaging the public with our collections, very often we start by thinking about the physical encounter with the material objects in our care. We want to bring people into our reading rooms and our physical learning spaces to share the joy of discovery from opening a box of archived material or handling a medieval manuscript or a rare book. I think if lockdown has taught us anything, it's that you don't necessarily need to do this in order to engage new audiences with, with your collections. You can achieve meaningful public engagement with history and heritage collections without having any access at all um, to your physical spaces and collections, although obviously um, that would help. I think as, as Isabel said, this creates a, a compelling argument for accelerating digitization and putting more resource into that and potentially less resource into providing physical access to collections. This has prompted me to think again about how we think about the impact and reach of our digital collections and to re-engage um, with Simon Tanner's work around the balanced value impact model and think about um, the societal impact for digital collections. Returning to the graph that I showed at the beginning, that surge in page views and browser sessions I described represents people in their homes thinking in some way about history and their own personal stories and connections to the past. The relative ease with which we have been able to recruit and sustain a group of heritage volunteers during lockdown demonstrate that this public history audience has included people with an appetite to engage in a project that seeks to ask critical questions about the past through research into the origins and early history of entity like the University of Leicester. I'd like to know more about the impact of lockdown on the public relationship with the past and what we can learn about this from the future. Another lesson that we've learned from this project, and this links again to thoughts of impact and, and audiences, is to not make assumptions about people's digital skills and capabilities. Our volunteers, a section of whom have been drawn from our local U3A and whom we might have thought would not engage in a project that was being, or would be less likely to engage in a project that was being um, delivered entirely digitally, have entered with enthusiasm and energy into our um, online um, learning events and, to, and, and remote volunteering opportunities and have begun, as you've seen, to contribute to our project blog. So what are some of the questions um, coming, coming from this, as I've put on the slide? Um, who are our new online audiences? What do they want and how can we keep them? Will our digital collections drop back to their pre-COVID levels of, access, of use um, or will we be able to su sustain that? And what will the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown have on how, the public, on how the public engagement with our collections, on how we deliver public engagement with our collections and services in future? Will we be accelerating the digital shift in libraries and archives? And I think more broadly thinking about heritage um, collections in the face of an uncertain economic and financial future, how can we use digital and digitization to build organizational um, resilience as defined um, in that um, quote from the, um, from the Heritage Fund. I think how we respond to the last of these challenges in particular has far-reaching implications for safeguarding the collections which underpin how historians can engage with and influence the political and social change that we're living through. And my closing quote, I've closed with another quote from Justin's um, inaugural lecture, uh, which captures the importance of this work. Uh, thank you. Be happy to take any questions or comments.